Ethan, I have to watch but say we're live. Is it, am I frozen or is it Liz? Is Liz frozen for everyone? I think it's Liz. Uh, oh, good. Okay. I think she was. What is she... <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome, welcome. If you're just joining us, which you probably are, it is Tuesday, January 31st, 7 p.m. on the East Coast, 4 p.m. on Chris's Coast. Um, Liz is holding her glasses up momentarily uh, until she unfreezes. Um, but anyway, welcome, welcome. As always, we've got a great panel for you tonight and a great discussion on exposure and response prevention, otherwise known as ERP. Uh, in the meantime, let us know you're here. Say hi. And um, let's see, Katie, you're good with what, what questions should we ask tonight while everybody kind of loads in and says hi? Oh, um, I wasn't ready for this. Um, Chris already has an answer. I can see it in his eyes. I know. I'm ready Chris to answer. Let's go. Wait, do you, do you have like, like fun questions? Yeah, we always yeah. do questions. Ooh, I always like to see who they would have them play. Like what actor or actress uh, would they want to play them in their story Ooh. of battling OCD and kind of life story? I always like to hear that. It's cool. Like the response. Amanda, if you want to write that paragraph. Um... <laughs> <laughs> or or like what's the best gift they ever gave? No, I, or... I like, I want to hear who they want to play. Okay, so uh, yeah. for those of you, if someone were to make yeah. a movie about you, who would you want to play? In the movie, you can just write the actor uh, in in the comments. So say hi, let us know where you're from, and the actor you would want to portray you in your film about you. I am not off the table for that role, um, by the way. So um, let's Chris, see. Chris, who would you want to play you? So everyone said, let me look him up before I say his name wrong. But there's this actor everybody says that I look like. I don't see it, but um, he's in Pitch Perfect. Ben Platt. Oh. oh, I know who you're talking about. The other guy. Uh, what's his name? Skylar Aston. People say I look like him. I just don't see it. I could see that. That's him. I can totally see that. Especially when I do my hair. If you squint like your me. eyes real hard. <laughs> and sit uh, upside down. Yeah. If you're just joining us, we'll get started in a 30 seconds. If you're just joining us, say hi. Let us know where you're from. And... Uh, if you want to answer the question, who would you want to play you in a movie about you and your story about OCD? We've got some answers coming in. Uh, also, hi from Adelaide, Australia. Nicole, great. It's I guess it's tomorrow. How's the future? Uh, Caitlin from Ontario. Uh, MK from Manitoba. Um, <laughs> Matt B wrote the OCD Advocate A-Team. We'll take that. We'll take it for sure. Uh, Somebody put Amelia Clark I, for Jessica did. That would be an awesome actress. I like her. To play you, Chris? No, to play her, Jess. Oh, Terrence Howard's great. Christian Bale for Matt B. I'll take that. He's He could probably do any one of us. Emma Stone. Um, ha, Weird Al Yankovic. Hank Blatt. I love that. That's hilarious. Um, Charlie from the short film, Charlie Bit My Finger. Yes, an early YouTube classic. Um, anyway, it is just after uh, 7.03, so let's get started. Uh, please feel free to keep... Uh, Load in the comment thread with your John, John wrote Chuck Norris. It ends there. That's it. We actually got a couple of Amelia Clarks. So um, I like Amelia Clark as well. Will Farrell. Uh, Katie, who would you get real quick to play you? Um, I don't know. I, I oh gosh, I don't know. Um, maybe Emma Watson. That'd be fun. Sure. How about Liz? I love the shirt. Okay. Um, Olivia okay. thinks we're all working, okay. so um, I don't know, you guys. I don't watch TV. I'm so bad. Maria Wilson. <laughs> I love TV. Perfect. Um, okay, so let's get you, some Ethan. What? Who's playing Ethan? Uh, Who's playing Jack you? Black. No, Mark Ruffalo. Oh yeah, Mark. Ooh. I don't know why I went Jack Black. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, okay, so uh, let's get some housekeeping out of the way, and then we'll, uh, oh, Natalie Portman, and Kristen Bell, Emma Watson is awesome, that's a fan, okay, so, uh, and oh, then we'll get started. Thank you, Jessica, I, I, want to be, I want Kristen Bell to meet, okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I almost hit Kristen Bell's daughter in a parking lot at Whole Foods, like, five years ago, not on purpose, she stepped out into the place that I was turning into, and, like, Kristen grabbed her and pulled her back, it was her fault, not mine. And then I got out to go, I'm so sorry. I'm like, oh my God, I almost killed Kristen Bell's daughter. That would be so <laughs> weird. It was pre-frozen, so it wouldn't have been as bad if I killed her. But like, you know, way worse after the fact. Anyway, hi, Olivia. And for those of you that don't know, that's Dr. Olivia McIndale. 
And uh, can you wave? She's muting and unmuting herself. Can you say hi to everyone? Everybody saying hi to you. She's not so sure, you guys. This is an ear. All right, so let's knock this out. <laughs> let's knock this out of the way, and then we'll jump into uh, into talking into talking, which is what we've been doing. So my name is Ethan Smith. I'm a national advocate for the International OCD Foundation. This community, con uh, this this town hall is intended to serve as educational content and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment-related questions, please be sure to work with your local provider or contact a local clinician. The ICDF is not a crisis hotline. If you are in a crisis or ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call 911 or the 988 Suicide and Crisis Hotline by dialing 988. Uh, we want to create a safe space and be kind and respectful to everyone. At the end of the day, we're all here to support one another. So I know this is being broadcast on several social media platforms and is being recorded so keep that in mind as you open up and share vulnerable content about yourself. But again, at the end of the day, we are here to support one another. And Olivia got some shout outs. So she's already she's already making waves in the OCD community. Um, so tonight we have an awesome panel. Uh, fellow National Lead Advocates, Chris, Liz, and Katie are here. Um, hi, Love Lana. Good to see you. Tonight we're talking all things ERP, exposure and response prevention. We throw that term out all the time. Um, and for many people that are on the lives and streams, they know what it is. Uh, maybe you don't. And a lot of people often hear it, but aren't exactly sure. So we thought we'd dig deep into ERP, discuss uh, what it is, and then go even deeper, answer your questions about ERP, engaging in treatment, how it's effective, why it's effective for OCD, the research behind it, and really any and all questions that you have around exposure and response prevention. Uh, we're also in luck because we also have two uh, clinicians on the uh, panel, Chris and Liz. So we can also answer your your clinical questions. And uh, I usually make up the answers and you don't know the difference, but that's okay. Um, and then of course we have uh, Reverend Katie O'Dunn uh, who is here to uh, take care of all your, your, your faith and, uh, and, and religiosity questions. So uh, not alone is the, not, not I mean, words are awesome at the end of the day. Not alone notes is here. Uma is here. Uh, we have a full house. So thank you so much for joining. All right. So Chris, let's start off with um, define ERP at its simplest what is exposure and response prevention? Yeah, so exposure and response prevention is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy, I, well, I'm in California. So I just explained to clients like cognitive behavioral therapy is California, ERP is LA. Like it's a type of cognitive behavioral therapy. And right now it's the most researched and it's the most effective treatment, frontline treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder. It's a behavioral and cognitive uh, treatment. So it's not medication. It doesn't involve anything like that. The only reason I say that is sometimes clients are feeling very anxious about medication and think that ERP can only be done in conjunction with medication. It's effective if it's done in conjunction, but it doesn't have to be. The concept behind it is all of us as people with individuals with OCD are usually doing too much or too little. So either we're you know, if I if I pick a pretty basic subtype that most people can kind of comprehend of just typical contamination, either people are constantly washing and cleaning and scrubbing or they're doing too little. So they're avoiding they're kind of, you know, leaving situations they find triggering. And so what ERP asks someone to do is really identify what are the things that matter to them and what are the things that OCD is preventing them from doing? And then with a trained clinician, you are going to work collaboratively to start to get yourself back into situations that you find valuable. So an example is, let's say a client with contamination isn't eating in public re uh, restaurants out of fear of touching silverware and dishes, even if they've been cleaned. The idea is if that's something important to them, which it is for most of us, the idea would be to have that client work up to getting into a public restroom, uh, restaurant, not a restroom, don't eat there, but a public restaurant. And once they're there, really engaging in the actions that they look around and see everybody else do. So using the fork, using the plate, et cetera. Now, what we're going to ask that person to do is refrain from doing any compulsions to kind of erase um, the work that they're doing. So that's what we call response prevention. So sometimes clients like uh, the word safety behavior. So when they're at that restaurant, making sure they're not kind of wiping things down or analyzing the plate or mentally compulsing as they're eating. Um, and as they do that over time, the brain learns. That's what happens is it starts to learn like, okay, restaurants are safe and I can start to engage. And over time, they'll be comfortable eating at different restaurants as an example of how ERP can work with a specific subtype. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, it's funny because I usually, um, Gerda, uh, and hi from Lithuania. That's amazing. 
Um, I actually want to get to your question sooner rather than later because I don't want it to get lost. It's actually a really, really great question and a topic that I've been talking on for a minute. So stay tuned and we'll get to that shortly. Um, I want to turn to Liz for a minute. Um, can you talk about a little bit about the history about exposure response prevention, sort of when it when it got on the scene and then started to become popular and why it's become the gold standard treatment? Yeah, you know, so ERP is something that's been around for decades. This is not a treatment that is new and that has just started. It's something that's been around for lots of years um, in the early 80s. And, you know, even before then, I think it was, was it 1950s or 60s, Ethan, when ERP was first researched? It was the 1960s when it was first um, on the scene. And then the early 70s, Edna Foa brought in kind of like the imaginal component. Right. And that's more of like what we know now. Yeah, so really like 60s and 70s is when we started seeing it, you know, kind of more widespread and talked about and, and you know, published behaviorally. But in the 80s is actually when like the first residential program for OCD was ever started. And it's when we really understood ERP on a much greater scale. So both, you know, from an outpatient, but also an intensive level and what it looked like. And that's really when we started to be able to understand that this is what's called the gold standard or frontline treatment for OCD. And what does that mean? Well, what that means is that it's the treatment that to date has had the most research. And so we know it is the most effective intervention for OCD to date. It is the most researched and it has really great outcome and really great results. That doesn't mean that ERP is the only treatment for OCD and it doesn't mean it's the only treatment that might work for you. But what it means is that it's the most researched. It's the most well-known. It's what we've studied and seen the most. And it's what we know is to be the most effective. One thing I want to talk for talk a second about that I think is really important. And well, maybe I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that later when we talk about if ERP works or not. So I don't want to jump ahead. But um, ERP has been around for decades. It is an incredible behavioral intervention that really when you think about OCD at its core, what is OCD? It's intrusive thoughts followed by repetitive behaviors. ERP is all about addressing, approaching, attacking those intrusive thoughts and not engaging in those repetitive behaviors so that we can retrain our mind and change our relationship with anxiety and OCD. And that's that's at the core of the treatment. And really it should be at the core of any OCD treatment, no matter what you do. Well said, Liz. And uh, and Leanne, good to see you. And you, feel free to load questions in the comment thread and, and we'll get to them. We usually start questions about 7.30, 7.45, but of course, if we can incorporate them sooner, we absolutely will. Uh, I love that Rob wrote, he was at the OCDI McLean in 1998, which is really impressive. And we'll get to his statement in a minute. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Rob. Uh, Katie, uh, from a from a personal lived experience, what was what was your experience with OCD and with ERP? Um, I was going to say, if you want me to tell my whole OCD story, we'll <laughs> we have a longer a longer conversation. But you know, so for me, um, ERP, which I know we'll get into more of the details of that tonight, but was very much life saving. And I think um, for me, when I first got an OCD diagnosis officially, um, I had really been navigating OCD, gosh, by this point for over 20 years, but didn't have an appropriate diagnosis, hadn't really received appropriate treatment. And ERP initially for me sounded incredibly scary because I was being asked for the very first time to lean into all of my fears and to not engage in what Chris shared with us as were safety behaviors, the things that were quote unquote, you know, getting me through the day. And that was really, really tough. Um, but I soon learned that by engaging in those things, I could actually reclaim my life. Um, I could actually start experiencing, um, <laughs> experiencing the things that I was doing, I felt for so long, like I was living two lives, which a lot of people might relate to. I was kind of going through my life. Um, but then I had this constant running commentary in my brain as I tried to keep myself safe, as I tried to keep everybody around me safe. And because of ERP for the first time, that second side actually started to get a little bit more quiet and I could engage in my life for the first time. And, um, it was really interesting, I think for me, cause I was 25 by this point. And, it was almost like, I don't know, it's kind of like a rebirth where you start to realize, oh, wait, this is what life can be where OCD isn't impacting you on a daily basis. Um, I know we'll get into it more tonight. ERP was tough for me to wrap my head around, but ultimately was so life changing, life saving and something that I'm so thankful for as a part of my journey. Thanks, Katie. And again, please feel free to load in the questions in the comments. If you have questions about ERP, engaging in ERP, what it's like. How, how you think you can um, improve or, or what you've struggled with really and nothing is off nothing is off the table um, 
Liz, I'm going to come back to you. I'm having fun interviewing y'all. This is fun. I'm going to come back to you. Um, why, why do we think that um, ERP is such a elusive treatment for individuals suffering from OCD? Like, why did it take me 17 years to even hurt, hear the term? Um, why, why is it something that you don't hear right off the bat? Where's the disconnect? Yeah, you know, I think it's a good question and, and I think it's getting better. I want to start by saying that I do think that we've seen an increase in the language for OCD, both diagnostically and treatment wise, right? I think when we were first diagnosed, Ethan, people didn't even know what OCD stood for, the acronym in and of itself. And granted, a lot of times now when people think of OCD, they they don't know what it really stands for or means, right? So we have to educate them, but even just some awareness of the acronym and um, a little bit about it being a mental health condition is improvement. And I think it's the same for ERP. I, I actually think that ERP is not as elusive as a term as it was when we were seeking treatment, but that still doesn't mean that it's easily accessible. And it certainly doesn't mean that individuals always know how to use it, right? One of the things I always tell people is if you're looking for a clinician and you see a provider and they say that they treat a lot of different disorders, like more than five, right? Um, and they're saying that they're using ERP and CBT and da 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 and all these other, all these other therapeutic interventions. You really need to sit back and say, can this be possible for them to be a specialist in ERP? And what I mean by that is that there is specialized, specific ERP training that some of us get where we spend years training and understanding OCD and OCD treatment to be able to appropriately engage in it with our clients and treat clients using it. And so I think that ERP actually, the language and people hearing about ERP is becoming more widespread, but it's still difficult to get ERP treatment. What I will also say, and what I want to talk about later, and that's kind of will be my soapbox for today, is that there's what I call like standard basic ERP and then great ERP. And I think they're two very different things, right? Providers can have some like basic understanding of ERP and maybe be able to treat some mild to moderate OCD versus a clinician who's really specialized and trained in it, right? It's kind of the difference of me being able to go to my primary care physician, you know, and, and do some basic blood work and be able to get some answers compared to something that warrants a specialist that I need further specialty care for whatever I'm going through. So I think that's important to think about too. Yeah, we can definitely make a note of that. So hold on to that. Um, and I also agree with you. I don't like when I go to a restaurant, like Cheesecake Factory, there's 400 things on the menu. I kind of question how good things are going to be. I'm not going to order sushi at the Mexican restaurant. So, you know, that's just me. So, um, you know, I totally agree with what you're saying. Chris, um, I, I know we get this uh, in the form of questions many times, but, you know, a lot of people worry like, okay, I get ERP or exposure response prevention for uh, physical compulsions, but I don't understand how you can do it for mental compulsions. Why is it just as effective a treatment for mental compulsions and intrusive thoughts as it is for physical? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. One of the most important things that I do with my clients that suffer or struggle with primarily mental compulsions. So they'll tell me, Chris, if you were to follow me around on a daily basis, you probably wouldn't see anything outward, but I'm really having a hard time focusing or paying attention because I'm consistently in my head. What I remind them is the O in OCD, that obsession, that's that first kind of comment or intrusive thought, intrusive image, et cetera, that comes from the disorder. Anything we then do with that intrusive thought, that's when the C comes in. That's the compulsion. And that's what we have power over controlling. So for instance, let's say I just left my friend's house and I was driving home and I started to think, wait, did I say something negative to them? Did I say a nasty slur? Did I put them down? Are they upset at me? If I'm sitting in the car next to that person, they're not doing anything physical. They're not tapping, but they're not really here physically. They're sort of in their head kind of thinking about it, right? That is the compulsion right there. Once the intrusive thought popped up, you said a slur to your friend, they're very upset. You feel that rush of anxiety and that panic. Anything they choose to do with that thought becomes the compulsion. So typically it's rumination. It's replaying the situation. It's trying to figure it out. It's trying to make it feel mentally okay. So that is just the same as somebody getting up and washing their hands. It just happens to be mental. So what we ask a, a, an individual with OCD to do an ERP in that moment is to say, what is the energy? What is that, that conflict that's going on in your head? What are you trying to solve? What is that active energy that you're doing? And we're going to do opposite behavior. We're going to take a more passive approach. So one of the things we hate with OCD is not completing things and not figuring things out. But that's what we're asking you to do with those mental compulsions. So as you're driving home, it's saying, you know what, I'm not going to figure out if I said a slur, 
in my head. I'm not going to try to solve it. I'm not going to try to try to figure it out. And this discomfort that I feel and that like not having that completion feeling, I'm going to let it sit there. I'm going to let it be present. I'm going to let it exist. And I'm going to move on to what I have to do next. So just like we're asking someone to stop washing their hands, we're asking someone to stop engaging in that kind of what if question and people with OCD don't like that. But over time, you'll learn all that wasted mental energy never solved the question in the first place. And you're actually getting more clarity as you walk away from compulsions. Well said. Um, well said. We'll get to questions shortly. I don't want to get too far behind because there's some great ones. Katie, would you say your engagement in ERP was sort of a, a steady improvement? Was it was it pretty linear for you or are there lots of ups and downs as you engage in exposure and response prevention. What, what was your experience like as you engaged in it and then continue to use it outside of, you know, regular treatment? Yeah. Um, oh gosh, there's, there's a couple parts to that. So for me, very much what Chris is talking about, um, a lot of the compulsions that I was engaging in were, were very much mental. So I was doing a lot of ruminating. I was doing a, a lot of mental review, things like that. It was one of the reasons that it took me a long time to get a diagnosis and appropriate treatment, because I really didn't know that these things were because of OCD. So a lot of what I initially was experiencing when I reached out for treatment, um, ended up working with um, Shala Nicely in Atlanta, who very much saved my life. Um, and she really educated me for the first time. I was working as, as a school chaplain and my OCD was latching on to everything significant to me, which I'm sure a lot of folks here tonight can relate to. It latches on to all of the things that are important to you and twists those things. And I was going through pretty much every day worrying did I say a, an inappropriate slur? Did I say something mean to someone? Did I accidentally hit a kid on crutches? Did I run over someone with my car? And my whole life became checking every little thing in my head, taking pictures of birthday cards, taking pictures of ovens and stoves to go back and check to make sure everything was okay. I mean, everything I did every second of the day. Um, and for me, ERP, when I got in with Shala for the first time, it was really hard but it actually made a lot of sense to me and I, I leaned into it pretty quickly and I saw a pretty fast trajectory of getting better. And that was pretty exciting for me for the first time. I was like, wait, I can live my life. I don't have to do these things all the time. I don't have to think so hard. I think the problem for me was when I started to get better for that first time, I made the assumption that I would never have to worry about OCD ever again. I felt like, all right, great, I'm cured. I don't have to deal with this. It's gonna be awesome. And um, I left treatment not anticipating continuing to have intrusive thoughts or having to navigate, which I now realize is a part of my daily life. OCD doesn't impact me in that same way, but I have to continue to use my skills and tools. Um, so unfortunately for me, shortly after I went through treatment the first time, I experienced a pretty traumatic um, and tragic loss in my school community where I was serving as a chaplain and my OCD absolutely latched onto it in a really big way. Um, I ended up hitting rock bottom and really experiencing things related to false memory kind of themes of OCD and harm OCD, worrying that I was responsible for losses that were going on in the community and went really right back to where I was before, maybe even worse in terms of engaging in, in compulsions. And um, my insight became really, really low. Ended up going back into treatment and the second time, it was a much bumpier road. It was so hard for me to lean in and to accept uncertainty about things that had happened that were really tough and things that I had been stuck on for such a long time. But when I got better that second time, I had a really different relationship with my treatment. And I realized that it isn't about um, getting rid of OCD. It's about a daily approach to uncertainty, um, embracing the uncertainty in every aspect of life and recognizing that I have OCD, but that it doesn't mean that it has to impact me. I can take every single day and say, yeah, I can sit with all of the discomfort around that. I don't have to engage in compulsions and I can step towards my values. And that's really where I am today. I wouldn't have wanted to have that relapse, but it changed my relationship with my OCD and I think ultimately brought me to a space of recovery to be able to advocate. Thank you, Katie, for sharing. Appreciate it. One last question and then we'll, we'll, we'll go out to uh, um, our, our viewers. Um, I'm going to throw it out to Liz because we get this question a lot and I'm sure you, and we all do. Um, so, and I'll, and I'll ask this from the place of, of somebody watching that may not know, 
can ERP treat all kinds of OCD, all subtypes and symptoms, or just like, you know, certain kinds? So this is a great question. So the answer is it can treat every subtype of OCD. And the reason why this is so important, you guys, is to recognize not just that it can treat any current subtype you're dealing with, that's critical, but also as Katie is mentioning, it ERP isn't just about treating your current symptoms. It's about understanding conceptually what ERP is doing, how it's changing your relationship with anxiety and OCD. And the reason this is so critical and important is that we don't want you to just understand ERP for your current triggers. I want you to understand ERP as a whole, the ERP process, the therapeutic intervention of ERP so that you can apply it later if you need to. If your OCD morphs, if a new subtype pops up, I want you to be able to actively and quickly engage in ERP before it becomes disabling or um, you know, interfering with your life. With that being said, one of the things I do wanna talk a lot about is that it is really important that you become the most informed clinician on your own OCD. And I'm going to say clinician because you have to become your own clinician, right? The goal of treatment is that you become your own therapist. And so what I mean by that is that one downfall I see a lot is that a lot of us that live with OCD may actually overlabel OCD. And what I mean by that is that we may have other symptoms coming up that aren't OCD. Maybe it's interpersonal stuff. Maybe it's um, eating disorder, right? Maybe it's, you know, all sorts of different things that can be coming up. And we don't want to lump that in as, oh, that's my OCD as well. And so it's really important for us to become super educated and knowledgeable of what most, let me back up, a lot of us and most individuals with OCD often have a comorbid condition as well. And so it's really important to understand what is your full clinical picture and which symptoms are which. And the reason this is important, Chris and I are going to talk on this, is because there's evidence-based interventions for everything we're dealing with. And so this is important because when you ask the question, kind of does ERP work across the board for OCD? The answer is yes, 100%. But ERP doesn't work actually for other symptoms that aren't OCD. And so this is important because sometimes people will say, well, hey, I did my ERP for this, but like it didn't, you know, help me not experience distress or like I still get really frustrated, you know, certain things where it's like, oh, actually like DBT would be better served for emotion regulation skills or distress tolerance skills versus it being OCD as the intervention for that. And so ERP 100% can address any and all OCD symptoms. And there's other interventions that are important for us to consider if we may be living with a dual diagnosis or we may, may be experiencing symptoms that don't fit a traditional OCD mold. Well said. I'm going to jump to uh, Gerda at 7.07 p.m. I love this question. It might be a little advanced, but I think we can give a, a little uh, intro to it. But uh, she asked, hi from Lithuania. Uh, I'm wondering, could uncertainty thing become a compulsion if you respond to every thought with maybe, maybe not? So many times in ERP, we're, we're taught to sort of embrace the uncertainty and suggest, well, maybe it will happen. Maybe it won't happen. I don't know. I'm going to live with the uncertainty and move on. But can that, in fact, become a compulsion? Absolutely. I'll jump mm -hmm. in first. The answer is yes. Like anything can become a compulsion. Any even treatment can become a compulsion. Am I doing treatment perfectly? Am I doing treatment correctly? Am I doing this right? You know, everything can become a compulsion. And maybe, maybe not statements can be really useful across the board, but they're actually not what we recommend for everything with OCD. Sometimes they're contraindicated and they might not be useful. So it's important to know that too, but others should talk. Sorry. I was going to add in there, it's always come back down to understanding the concept. I think sometimes what people think maybe, maybe not is a couple things. Sometimes people think that there's like a 50-50 chance something will happen. That's not always true. Or the other thing is their therapist taught them to say maybe, maybe not. And they're going through the motions just simply to say it. And like you're saying, Gerda, that becomes a compulsion. So it's like, I had this thought. I have to say maybe, maybe not. Let's look underneath what, what we're hoping to achieve with this. The OCD is presenting you with some kind of problem. It's never a problem that's happening to you right now, right? It's never like, I am dying right now from a disease or I am literally hitting somebody with a car. It's something that you did in the past or you might do in the future. And so your brain wants you to engage in kind of going on a fact-finding mission to get some answers. And as we know, we don't have any new data we're collecting. So we just kind of ruminate and just rehash the same kind of things all together. So what the, the statement is asking you to say is, look, I'm going to stop 
what I'm doing right now. I'm going to step back from these mental and physical compulsions. And by saying, hey, it might come true, might not come true. You know, what? I'm, I'm actually not even going to try to figure it out. You're walking away from the problem. Well, what does that teach your rational mind? It teaches your rational mind that I no longer want to spend the next hour, six hours on this issue. Maybe it's not as dangerous as I once thought. You'll start to notice your anxiety kind of go down. And with your clearer mind, you'll, you'll recognize, ooh, this is starting to smell, taste, and feel like OCD. Let me walk away from it and stop putting in so much compulsive behavior into it. So it's really underneath is designed to have you kind of sit with the unknown versus trying to figure something out, which is the mistake we always do. I worked with a very, I oh, go ahead, Katie. Oh, no, I was just, I was just going to say, you know, two pieces for, for me, this very much became compulsive at a certain point where I really thought that I was, I was like, great, I'm just going to say maybe, maybe not all the time. And it's going to be fantastic. But the reason I was doing it was because I was actually trying to decrease my anxiety, which is the opposite of really what the whole point is. It's just not to engage in it. So for me, it became something that wasn't necessarily super healthy. And I learned over time that that's not what it's all about. If you're if you're saying it because you want the thoughts to go away or because you want to get better, because you want to decrease your anxiety, probably not helpful. But if it's a legitimate way to not engage with the thought or to um, actually embrace the uncertainty, these can be helpful. But I think for me, one of the things that also helped was looking at the fact that there are lots of non-engagement responses that you can use. And some for me actually made more sense to my mind than maybe, maybe not. I know the IOCDF has a great resource of a whole bunch of different non-engagement responses. Um, and there were others for, for me um, that made it feel less 50 50. And to Chris's point, I went into that for a long time of, of assuming, oh, it's a 50 50 shot, or that means I have to accept the worst is true. And that's not it. It's about accepting the same level of uncertainty that you do with everything else while choosing to trust that probably OCD, and we can probably hang out with all of the doubt and uncertainty that comes up around it. So for me, maybe, maybe not became compulsive, but there were other things for me that I could say, like, yeah, that would suck but I can sit with that. Um, there's, there's different responses. I think that um, you can talk to your clinician about that, that might work for you as you think about um, the reasons that you're using them. In my early um, treatment, I had a really aggressive clinician uh, who we all know. And, um, and uh, Katia, I didn't get the benefit of maybe, maybe not. She would just tell me flat out that my biggest fear was happening or was going to happen. And I am that thing and to just deal with it and move on with my life. And I was just like, what, wait, what do you mean? And I mean, like, she never said maybe, maybe not. I would come in and be like, I think I hit my head and I have a brain bleed. And she's like, no, you do have a brain bleed. I'm like, well, no, you're just saying that. She's like, no, I'm not. You have a brain bleed and you're probably going to die. But between then and your death, what do you want to do today? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm what do you mean I'm going to die? No, you're probably going to die. And it was just very emphatic. But like over time, I was just like, yeah, I do. I'm, I'm dying. Like we have a bleed and let's go party. Like, you know, so it was like, I've always kind of, kind of um, assumed this idea of, yep, I'm, I'm. I'm a murderer and I'm going to be the best worst person I can possibly be by feeding the hungry. Like, why not? You know? Um, and that's just kind of the hardcore approach, but there's to everybody's point, there's a lot of different approaches and, and really what speaks to you personally and what's most effective for your, uh, for your OCD. So great that's answers. Cool. And just to that point of the best, one of my favorite phrases when someone says like, Oh, the day is ruined. It's going to be the wrong kind of day. Like, Let's have the best wrong day ever. Um, and I just, I love that, that we can, we can take it, we can hang out with all of it and still have the best version of all of the stuff that our OCD is saying. Absolutely, Katie. So Rob Wilcox at 7-Eleven, this is, this I think will answer a few questions for some people and I'll turn it over to Liz since she runs a residential program. Um, I was at the OCDI at McLean in 1998. I did a huge amount of ERP there. It all revolved around contamination and health anxiety. Uh, the goal was to primarily greatly limit hand washing and to keep it to before eating after using the bathroom. And if my hands were noticeably dirty, I achieved that. However, now with the pandemic, I am told to do the opposite of that. I'm being told to wash my hands when I enter my apartment, et cetera. How are things now being done at live in treatment facilities? Liz, you look fantastic. Let's keep the caption up. Go ahead. Please feel free to answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can lower the caption. Man. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I was going to try to raise my chair so y'all could see my face, but um, it's a great question. You know, and one of the questions, this is a question we get a lot is, well, since the pandemic, you know, we need to do more rituals or like, you know, the world is telling us to do things differently. And the answer is, is that again, remember there's a big difference in doing something because 
it's warranted and it's what's recommended by CDC or for hygiene purposes versus doing something for your OCD. So I don't really know that there's any recommendations anymore that like we need to be hand washing when we enter our buildings, you know, so if, but if that is still a true CDC or doctor recommendation for you, I want you to follow that. But what I don't want you to follow is OCD's rules around it. So that includes cleaning your phone, cleaning your keys, anything else that was cross-contaminated, not willing to touch something from the outside that has come into the inside after you've engaged in a hand wash, doing a hand wash for much longer than what's recommended or required or, or encouraged or whatever we want to say, right? So all those things are important to keep in mind. And so with that being said, when we're at the residential clinic, like I'm not really telling people when to wash their hands and when not to, I'm basically saying like, we need to eliminate all OCD hand washes. So yeah, if you cook raw chicken, you want to wash your hands after great. Like that's a great idea. And I'm on board with that as long as it's not a 30 minute OCD hand wash, right? If it's a, if it's a, a sanitary or hygiene hand wash, that's okay. It's no different than showering, right? Our goal in treatment, we don't tell people we want you to never shower again. Like that's not realistic. That's not hygienic, but I really don't want you to engage in OCD rituals in your shower or be showering for OCD. I want you to be showering for hygiene purposes. And so again, it's much less about the behavior itself and much more about the function of the behavior. So we want to be thinking about what function does this behavior serve versus the actual behavior that someone's engaging in. You know, all four of us, even if we didn't have OCD or we weren't talking about our OCD, we have different behaviors and ritualistic things that we engage in as just a part of our life. And they're all different. The days we wash our hair, the days, right, it gets different for all of us. We all have a different different system or a different way of going about that. And it's not a right or wrong. It's just different. We're, we're human beings. We have, you know, different things in it. But again, if we're doing it for OCD, that's when we want to make a shift or a change. And so from a residential standpoint, we changed for a while when there was a lot of requirements around hand sanitizing when you came in and out of buildings doing certain things. But now I think we're going back to a much more kind of normal way of living just like the world is. Anything else to add, Chris or Katie? I was just going to say, I mean, what, what you're learning there, what Liz was just explaining is to be flexible. And I think that's one of the difficulties a lot of people with OCD have. I still have clients that are wiping down mail or they're wiping down packages and it's, okay, you got that information a couple years ago. We need to adjust with the information. So, um, you know, obviously, like Liz was saying, there's a lot of movement towards different behavior than what we were doing two years ago. You got to be able to be flexible. And I always talk to my clients about bigger concepts. You know, when you're talking about cleanliness, it's this. But in general, with OCD, we got to be flexible. We got to be able to adapt. And just to note, my my favorite question is what Liz just said: is what's the function? And um, I mean, really, again, the content of OCD doesn't matter. I work with folks all the time navigating religious scrupulosity. And again, whether it's what we're talking about with cleanliness or if we're talking about prayer or a religious ritual, again, coming back to what's the function, I would never ask someone not to pray or do something meaningful to them um, in the form of their faith tradition. But I would ask them to maybe not do something that's driven by the OCD, to not do something that's driven by fear or guilt or shame but rather to do the things um, that are actually functioning as a part of bringing them closer to their faith. So I just, the question across the board, what is the function of what you're engaging in is so important. Absolutely. Uh, Leanne Rice is the panel taking questions right now. I think that's brave of you because that's a question and you still didn't know when you asked it anyway. So good <laughs> on you. You were taking a risk and we appreciate that. Uh, real quick, I love wins. Uh, Hank at 7, 12 PM wrote ERP works 101% was in a residential treatment setting and was working on bathroom exposures, touching shower handles with a six out of seven on the anxiety scale, put on back burner and did smaller exposure at 7.13 PM, Amanda, part two of two, smaller exposure steps. And two weeks later, went back to shower handles and was at two out of seven on a scale and was only on a list for one more day. It was nice to have the proof right here in front of my eyes. So I love that. Congratulations, Hank. Yes, ERP does in fact work. Carrying on the contamination conversation at 7.30 PM, snacky or snaky, um, um, uh, I have an issue with contamination OCD, not so much of a question, but I think it's worth addressing a little bit. I'm immunocompromised and currently on prednisone, which makes one more susceptible to infections. I feel so conflicted. So basically the conversation here is, well, yeah, I have a reason to be overvigilant, you know, well, then where is the line for me? Um, Chris, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Like, okay, I have OCD and a legitimate compromised immune system. So 
Yeah, I believe sometimes one thing, especially I hear from new clinicians that consult with me, they're really, really nervous about anything being, you know, reassurance for the client. But I remind people that sometimes you need information, right? It's not reassurance if they're finding out information for the first time. So if I'm if I'm working with a client and they do have contamination OCD, but they do have also health conditions that could potentially put them at a risk. What I'm going to do is collaborate with that doctor and get information from that doctor. What specifically in this case, I'm going to say snacky because I just like that name, despite snaky. I don't like snakes. I like snacks. So I'm going to go with snacky. But, um, you know, it's like if I was working with snacky, I would, I would ask, like, what does your doctor say you should do? And once they tell me that, that's what we're going to do. We're not going to go one iota above it because OCD likes to play an MD, a PhD, a psychiatrist likes to be everything. Right. And start to tell you, like, hey, you should do this or not do that. So we want to make sure that we're not doing above and beyond what the doctor is recommending. And as a clinician, I'm going to keep that as part of the, the treatment. Like they were saying earlier, I always ask clients, what is the motive behind your behavior? And if it's strictly to reduce anxiety and strengthen the OCD, we're going to let it go. If it's because your doctor informed you to please do this, then we'll follow that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, 7.14 p.m. Lee asked, Leanne asked, this is a great question. We get this all the time. And I think um, we'll, we'll let Liz start it off because uh, she built a website. And then we'll, we'll kind of go over to uh, Katie and myself from there. Uh, question. I was wondering if I could do effectively do exposures on my own at home. Since I have germaphobe type OCD, I will not go anywhere, including to a therapist or doctor's office. Is If yes, is there a worksheet on IOCDF on that? And to just piggyback on that, you know, not only is there sometimes a barrier to treatment because of the OCD, but accessing because of where you are geographically or perhaps economically or financial barriers. So a lot of barriers to, um, to accessing uh, treatment with a treatment provider. So Liz, what are your feelings on uh, ERP at home with yourself? Yeah, so <laughs> ERP at home with yourself, I think that it is – Possible, absolutely, and it can work. Um, with that being said, at least the latest research I had read, which was, I'm going to be candid, not anytime super recent, um, most of the self-help programs were proved to be most successful if you did in-session ERP at least a couple times. So having the ability to work with a clinician and do ERP together once or twice before you continue on that self-help method often proved better results than self-help alone. Um, again, this was this isn't necessarily the latest research, I, you know, but this is makes sense intuitively. And, and one of the reasons as a clinician, I'd always recommend that if we can, is that it allows us to make sure you understand the concepts, right? So sometimes we think we're doing ERP correctly, but we're actually reinforcing our OCD because we're not recognizing mental compulsions or illumination as a compulsion or different things like that. Um, and so it is really great if you can work together with a clinician to help build that hierarchy and, and really be able to understand kind of how to do this treatment on your own and what that would look like. With that being said, again, you know, as Ethan mentioned, the access to care is a huge deal. What I will say, though, is that the blessing of COVID is the introduction of teletherapy. And because of telehealth and us being able to do therapy remotely, you can get an amazing clinician to do ERP from your home. And many clinics, just like ours here in Houston, have student and trainee and sliding skill rates where we could see a patient for as little as $5. And so it's one of those things to always think about is look into the options to see if you could at least do some sessions together with somebody who understands ERP, even if it's just at the beginning to kind of I don't know what the right word would be, but like to build the groundwork to then say, okay, I feel like I have a really strong foundation. I can build the rest of the house myself at this point. Katie, anything to add? No, I mean, just, just spot on. I, 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 I'm appreciating, I'm looking down further actually where Robin's asking is telehealth as effective as in-person for ERP. And I wonder not to step on your hosting toes, Ethan, but if Chris or Liz might be able to speak to that along these lines too, because I, I think this is a significant question and something I get a lot from folks of, is that as effective as seeing someone in person along with kind of these self-help help methods? Yeah, I, I was going to say there's research. And I, even before the pandemic, there was research on telehealth being as effective. And then there's current research, obviously, with the pandemic that it is as effective. So what I always tell people is now it's more of a personal preference. So are you somebody that learns and can pay attention and can be accountable in a virtual setting? If the answer is yes, then it's shown to be as effective. In fact, for me, I sometimes enjoy virtual if the client's home is a big trigger because there's things that they can do with me in session 
in their home that they might not be able to do, especially if uh, some of the things that they're struggling with are, you know, bolted to the ground. So there's some benefits of it as a clinician. So I really think it in the research is there. So I think it really then just comes down to preference. Yeah, for sure. I remember I always felt super safe in a clinician's office. Like I was there with an expert and they could take care of me if something went wrong. I was the kid at 31 that was like holding onto the doorknob crying while they tried to pull me off in residential. It was super fun. Um, anyway, so moving on. Uh, thank you. That's a good point, Chris. And thank you for addressing that, Katie. Uh, 7.19 p.m. Um, and Katie, I actually have a question coming up for you. Just not this one. Uh, 7.19 p.m. Using ERP with my daughter and intrusive thoughts. I understand I understand exposure to the thoughts is important. She is six and her common intrusive thoughts don't bother her anymore because of the ERP we have done, but new thoughts just arrived. So how do you ever come to an end with ERP? What's the end game? Is it the hope if a new intrusive thought arises, she will just be able to dismiss it eventually without doing ERP against it? Uh, that's at 719, uh, Amanda. Oh, yeah, I, I figured you just realized it would cover up Liz, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss that out uh to uh to chris or liz to start they could they're probably gonna swap anyway but um i think it's i think a maybe quickly not to tell you how to answer this with my all of my clinical experience but um i think this raises a good point at how early uh, somebody can start erp so just just tossing that out there is maybe a starting point chris yeah yeah i mean i what i i was it's, it's a long question so i was just reading it real quick but what I think happens, and it's something that Liz and I have talked about, is in the beginning, the idea of content of your OCD is to do exposures around that content. But what I'm really working on with clients is how do you understand the biggest component of OCD? So as your daughter is using ERP on intrusive thoughts, and it seems to be working, which is great. You know, her common intrusive thoughts don't bother her anymore. But yes, over time, new thoughts are going to arrive. Should you ever come to an end with ERP? So the good news is like for your daughter, the tools that she's used on her current intrusive thoughts, it's going to be the same tools throughout. Now, the awesome thing about our brain is our, our brain has these kind of neural pathways. So if I, for instance, put on my seatbelt every single day, that pathway to put on my seatbelt is pretty, pretty strong. And I don't even think about putting on my seatbelt. Uh, I, I think like putting on seatbelt, brushing your teeth, like those are things that are just automatic that we do without even thinking over time, what happens because your daughter's used to now, you know, treating these thoughts as intrusive, not engaging with the thoughts and moving on that process doesn't feel like treatment anymore. It just starts to feel like just everyday functioning. And especially because she's so young, her brain is so has so much neuroplasticity and is going to pick up on that quicker. So for instance, in my case, I had intrusive thoughts around harming family members, uh, both physically and sexually. I don't wake up each day and have new thoughts that I have to deal with. Over time, I responded to those thoughts so quickly that sometimes it felt like a matter of seconds. And then over time, those thoughts don't even appear. So the nice thing is by doing the treatment, not only do the thoughts stop coming as frequently, but in my case, a lot of those thoughts don't even come up for me anymore. The second question, yeah, so to answer that, you'll dismiss it without even having to do ERP. In the transition period, I'm in a really good place now, but even after treatment, before I got into like full recovery, there was times that I was dismissing thoughts without even realizing it. I was at a friend's house and, you know, watching a movie and a thought would come up and I'd barely pay attention. To answer your question, Ethan, the research shows that about eight is when, when kids really understand CBT. But based off of developmental, based on, you know, all these different factors, I've worked with kids as young as six and five. What I would say the difference is, is that it's going to be a lot more parent support. So we're going to want the parents in the treatment and it's going to be a lot of including them as well. But I've had kids as young as five and six really understand the treatment and do really well. And it sounds like her daughter's doing well also. Liz, do you have anything to add? I can unmute myself. Um, yeah, you know, I, Shannon Shai said this on a webinar that we did quite a while ago that I just absolutely loved. And one of the things he said when I asked him, I said, so where do you consider yourself at this point? Are you cured from OCD? Are you managing OCD? What's it like? And he said, you know, I don't really care what you call it. You can call it management. You can call it a cure. But what I can tell you is I have no fear or anxiety of anything OCD tries to throw at me. And I loved that. And what I loved about it is it's the concept of, ERP should not feel like this grueling process that we have to keep doing every day to be able to be functional. If that's what it feels like, that we have to like 
push and survive through ERP to make it through the day, we're doing treatment wrong. If you're going to your therapist every week and you're talking about all the triggers from the week and you're coming up with a game plan every week about how to address the current triggers, we're doing something wrong. It should be that we're starting to see glimpses of freedom across the board. And we start to, again, understand ERP not as something to target our current symptoms. Yes, that's going to happen in the process, but that's not what the treatment's about. It's about what it teaches us and what we get to take home from and across the board. And so the goal is that your family, your, your, your child, I'm sorry, I saw that message come up about my um frame is perfect because it showcases your lovely shelf. And then I, for some reason, thought family. I don't know why. Um, thank you for that. But when you ask about your child, right, it's ERP should get easier, but it should become second nature. And again, it shouldn't feel like this difficult exercise or treatment process. It actually can become kind of exciting and fun. Like, oh, there's a new fear today. I'm excited to challenge it. It's, it becomes this like fun challenge that we're having. But again, to go back to what Shannon said, I loved the thought process that I'm not afraid of anything OCD throws at me. Because what I always tell my patients is that it shouldn't be about us extinguishing current symptoms or current fears. It should be about us not having any core fears anymore that are sticking. Ethan, I'm going to throw you under the bus, right? But if Ethan were to tell me like, oh, Liz, I'm doing really, really well as long as I don't start to get a stomach ache again. Or as long as I'm not, I don't see that there's some expired food in your fridge. I'm gonna be like, well, then Ethan, we got to get to the core, right? Because we that means there's still some fear that's hanging on there. But if we've extinguished the fear all the way, we're not afraid of any triggers that we might face or that are thrown at us. You can't throw me under the bus if I have an experience. It's, that's a good example, but I'm fine. Sorry, I, throwing you under the bus was a bad analogy, but I just meant like I'm using you as an example without your permission. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, and I love, Liz, I love that you said exciting and fun. And I know Leanne just, just added that too. And that was such, just in my own experience, such a transition for me. And I worked with someone who really um, tried to, in the beginning, it seemed like it didn't make sense to me, but we really tried to say every time a new trigger came up throughout the day, I would actually say like, yes, I am so excited to face this intrusive thought and to sit with all of it so that I can make OCD a little bit smaller. And at the beginning that felt very ridiculous. And over time, it actually was kind of a fun thing where it became almost this challenge every day of great. What are you going to throw at me OCD? Like I'm ready to handle it. Um, and eventually you stop feeling like you have to fight in that same way because it just, you're so, you're so expecting it that it's not popping up in the same way that it used to and you're not noticing it. Yeah. And I just want to echo what everybody else has said, which is, you know, for the most part, dealing with OCD thoughts feels very involuntary to me. The ERP, um, the, ear, the access of the ERP seems very involuntary where I just find myself engaging in it and not realizing it. I remember one time many years ago, a therapist asked me, well, how many times do you think you're doing ERP a day? And I actually had to pay attention to how I maneuvered. It was quite a few. I just did, wasn't aware I was doing it, which is a really cool place to be. Really quickly, going back, uh, Nyla, to your daughter, you know, there's a couple things to Chris's point also that I want to add, which is number one, obviously, it can feel a bit whack-a-mole right now because um, just the intellectual comprehension at that age probably doesn't resonate that, oh, right now you're dealing with uncertainty and embracing uncertainty all around. And it doesn't matter what it is, it's uncertainty and that will come. Right. So as she gets older and realizes what she's been doing and why it works and how it works and all the things that we've been talking about, I think that will start to extinguish the possible feeling of whack-a-mole around intrusive thoughts. But in the meantime, if she recognizes that the ERP works, I mean, a lot of therapists that I know, I'm just repeating what they've said, you know, really like to look at ERP as like a game. And as a new intrusive thought comes up, you can say, hey, remember that thing you did for that other one? Can you do it with this one too? And like, yeah, I can totally do it. Such and such may happen or whatever. And then, you know, it's just... And then it's gone. So just something I wanted to add to it. Jessica Ivy. It, yes, Katie. But no, I was just going to say, I don't know if you saw Nyla just said too, that she's created games to play your do with ERP with their daughter and her daughter now asked to do ERP. And that's like, what a, oh, what a cool so thing. Cool. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't see that. Nyla and I are on the same wavelength. Excellent. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Yeah, there it is. There's proof. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, for sure. At that age, games is, is really effective. I play games with Katie too, and it's really, mm -hmm. really effective as well. So uh, Jessica Ivy, 7, 9 p.m. Katie, so you would say rumination is a compulsion? That's OCD rumination. Well, that's is that the full? Okay. Um, 
Oh, the full, okay. Is OCD rumination a compulsion? Yes, absolutely. Um, so for me, rumination is, is really my primary compulsion. Um, and there have been different things throughout, throughout my life, but, um, Chris kind of spoke to this a little bit earlier with, with mental compulsions, but, um, for me, a lot of my experience was an intrusive thought popping up. And then I would immediately go into ruminating about it. Meaning I would say, well, what does that thought mean? Um, what, how can I try to figure this out? Um, is there something in the past that makes this significant? Does that mean that I'm a bad person? Am I going to do X, Y, and Z? Um, and all of that for me was engaging in rumination as a compulsion. And um, a big component of my treatment was noticing, wait, all of this that I'm going through in my mind, all of this mental review, all of this rumination, all of this trying to remember things from the past, trying to figure out if it's a good thought or a bad thought or what kind of thought it is, is actually a compulsion the same way as if I was doing something physical. Um, and being able to notice that and each time say, oh, look, I'm ruminating right now. I can come back to the moment and I can make the choice not to do that was really, really empowering for me. Um, I think because it was happening in my mind for such a long time, I felt like, oh, I can't control it. But you really can. And I know Liz and Chris can speak more to this from the clinical perspective, but it was really empowering for me to recognize, yes, I can't control my intrusive thoughts. But even when it comes to mental review, mental compulsions, rumination, I can make the choice to not continue to engage with that in my head. I think as a community and as clinicians, we always have to remind our clients that the O and C is very different. And that's why sometimes, you know, you'll hear people, hear people say, oh, my God, I've been obsessing all day. You can't obsess all day. Obsession is you left the, you know, the, the stove on. You just hit somebody with your car. You're attracted to children. OCD doesn't give you a six hour monologue about your attraction to children. It just throws that at you accompanied by stress hormones that we then, then get into that fight or flight and we start to panic. So then we take that thought and it's our choice how to respond to that O. And if we make the mistake of doing rumination, which indeed is a compulsion, now we're just spinning on it. A reminder, rumination is a real disorder. It's not even for OCD. It's actually a disorder where people, typically children, chew up their food, spit it out, and then re-chew it, kind of like birds do. But I like that visual for our thoughts because we will keep chewing up and spitting the same thought out. What's different, somebody without OCD needs new thoughts or new information to continue on that thought pattern, but we'll spend, a, you know, days or hours or months, right, on the same thought over and over. So if you're finding yourself with an intrusive thought at 8 a.m. and it's 5 p.m., it is now turned into a compulsion, and that's where you have to really do the treatment to disengage with the rumination. Now, that's going to mean you're walking away from it. It's going to feel irresponsible, but what you'll start to notice is when you walk away from the rumination, you actually get the clarity you were seeking in the first place. I love wow. the idea too of leaving the courtroom for folks. That was a metaphor that really helped me kind of through this journey of, okay, the obsession pops up. And as soon as I start to defend this in my mind, as soon as I sit down for that law and order case and try to figure out what this meant, if all of these bad things could happen or would happen, well, okay. All of those things are the compulsion. And I have the chance to walk out of the courtroom, not to continue to try to prove that the thought meant something or didn't mean something. It's literally standing up, walking out of the courtroom and no longer engaging. And I think there's something really powerful about recognizing that, again, like Chris said, we don't have a choice about the O, that initial little thing that pops up. But everything that comes after that, we do have a chance to walk out of that and to walk back into our life. So this is a great segue into what Liz wanted to talk about earlier. So I have not forgotten about Liz and we'll, we'll use a segue. 7.20 p.m. Claudia asks, how do I know if my daughter is receiving great ERP? She struggles in the bathroom. So Liz, um, maybe we'll answer the question. Then you can go into the difference between what's good, or good ERP and what's awesome ERP, as you stated earlier. Yeah. So, you know, I think the first thing we want to see, sorry in advance, I know I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> um, so... I think what's awesome ERP, what, what we want to think about when we think about ERP is what are we seeing as the outcomes? And that's important, but that does not mean for any of us that I could tell you, hey, if you have a certain outcome by two weeks or four weeks or six weeks, it's going great. And if you don't, it's going bad. Like that, that's not necessarily the case. And so what I mean by that is that we really need to be, first of all, 
you should be communicating with your child's clinician if it's a child. And you want to understand what phase of treatment are they in? Chris and I will tell you that we don't begin ERP if our patients aren't ready. We do psychoeducation. And so I might spend three to four weeks getting somebody ready, doing readiness work before we're going to start doing ERP. And so you wouldn't expect there to be progress yet. But really, once we're engaged in ERP, so four weeks, six weeks in, you should start to see a difference. And by 12 to 16 sessions of active ERP, you should absolutely be seeing a big difference. Now, that doesn't always mean it's not a great clinician. It could be that your child needs a different level of care, or again, maybe there's something else going on or comorbidities that you may need to think about other interventions or other treatment approaches to consider. So those are all things we want to take into account. But if we want to jump into, in my opinion, what is good versus great ERP, I want us to be thinking about core fears. And I want us to really be sitting back and saying, are we doing ERP where we're just extinguishing triggers or are we actually getting to our core fears? Because if we're getting to a place where we can get freedom from our core fears, then OCD can't really keep shifting or keep moving or keep living. But if we're just doing symptom management with what I would call standard or decent ERP, it will keep feeling like that exhausting game of whack-a-mole. And I talked about this earlier, but if you're going to your session every week saying, okay, how do I address this week? What do I, what do, I do this week? And here's my triggers. Then we're probably just kind of doing standard ERP. We might be being told, okay, go touch that thing a million times and go and make sure you don't wash your hands. That's great. But I also, and, and it will, if this candle is contaminated, you know, if I touch it and don't wash my hands and I keep touching it, not washing my hands, eventually this candle won't feel contaminated. We can all agree with that. That's decent ERP. Most clinicians who aren't specialized in OCD would say that's great ERP, right? Because wow, like that's really good. You've got exposures and response prevention. And it's better than what a lot of people get, which is exposures, no response prevention, not ERP at all, whatever. But for those of us who live with OCD, this method of ERP is exhausting. Not only do we have to keep doing ERP for every single thing in our life that's contaminated or triggering, but things will keep shifting. And we will constantly be having to do ERP all the time to feel like we, should fun we can function. ERP should be about touching this candle as the exposure, not washing our hands as the response prevention and addressing the core fear. So why is this candle contaminated? Ethan, if I asked you, you told me this candle was contaminated and I said, well, why is it contaminated? What, what, let's just do a quick role play. Like, why is it contaminated? Uh, Cause you were cooking raw chicken and then you moved the candle from one side of the counter to the other. Okay, so because I was cooking raw chicken and touched the candle, it's contaminated and so if you touch it and it is contaminated, what's, what are you afraid of? I could get food poisoning. And what happens if you get food poisoning? Well, then I'll, you know, throw up all night and I'm really scared of throwing up and, uh, yeah. Yeah. What, so if you throw up all night, so what, why is that? What's the big deal? Mm, it's uncomfortable. Ah. And so we learn what the core fear is if we're asking enough probing questions, and I'm going to guess here, Ethan, because I stopped, we could have kept going, that the core fear here was actually the fear of feeling uncomfortable. The fear of feeling uncomfortable. And maybe I could keep going and maybe you would have said, Ethan, you know, and if I'm uncomfortable, that might mean that I've got something going on and it, maybe I'm going to die. And maybe the core fear is actually dying, right? But we need to figure out what the core fear is. If I ask Chris, what's his core fear around this candle? He might say, I'm afraid I'm going to have bloodborne illness. Right. So we can it it's not the same core fear, right? Core fears are different for all of us. And so as a clinician, I can't just say, oh, this is this is what would make sense for your ERP. I have to know you individually and I have to know what your core fears are. And if we start approaching not just the candle, but Ethan's core fear. So I actually have Ethan touching the candle. And when he starts thinking, oh, man, what if I'm contaminated now? I'm uncomfortable. I might get sick. That's when we insert uncertainty. Right. I'm like, eh, like. I guess, you know, ah, sorry guys. It's okay, um, uncertainty is calling. My goodness, yes. Uncertainty <laughs> is calling you, Ethan, right now. Um, so like that's when you start to address the core fear. So you insert uncertainty of like, yeah, like 
I guess, like, I don't know for sure if this was contaminated with raw chicken and I'm going to choose not to solve that. Right. Or maybe you go further of like, you know, maybe I'm going to get sick. Maybe I'm not. Or like, oh, definitely going to feel uncomfortable forever now that I've touched that candle and probably never going to not feel uncomfortable. And I'm just going to have to accept that feeling for the rest of my life. Whatever your fears are, we want to approach that or welcome that, you know, or acknowledge that, whatever we want to call it, while we touch that contaminated thing. Because again, if we do that, now we're not just approaching the candle being contaminated. We're approaching the core fear. Because I can promise you for Ethan's fear around this, the candle isn't the only thing that's contaminated. But if he addresses the core fear, a lot of those other items that are contaminated will also wipe away and you won't have to target do targeted ERP for every single thing. Two questions. One is you're not charging me for that, are you, Liz? Yes, no. I'll send you a bill later. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. And secondly, um, so to that point, is, is, or does research show that, you know, X amount of core fears probably relates to a high percentage of someone's um, subtypes and symptoms around certain things. And if you do extinguish those X core fears, then you are extinguishing a high percentage of their OCD around various things. For sure. Right. And this is why, while hierarchies can be good, a lot of us don't create, don't do that many hierarchies because what we find is that when we extinguish or address the core fear, a lot of different things wipe away at once. Right. And so, cause for most of us with OCD, the thought of having to address every single trigger is like totally exhausting and overwhelming. And so again, it's, can we address what's at the core or the root so that we can get freedom across the board and it's not going to keep growing back or shifting or, or coming up in different areas. For sure. Thank you for that, Liz. That was awesome. Um, anything to add, Chris or Katie? Yeah. I mean, first of all, there was a question or a comment by TG that they couldn't figure out what their son's core fear is. Typically, if somebody can't figure out a core fear, it's most likely that they just don't want to feel uncomfortable forever. You know, the the fear of feelings. Can you talk about that, Chris? How when people, you can actually have a fear of a feeling and that is the core fear. Absolutely. So if a client has gone through OCD, obviously for years, and they don't like the discomfort, distressing emotions that pop up, notice how I didn't say negative. I think, you know, sometimes people call them negative emotions, but if a loved one died, I want to feel sad. I want to feel anxious, right? To process, but we have discomforting feelings at times. And so what starts to happen over time is somebody might be afraid of feeling those feelings. And so a big compulsion is constantly like scanning how they feel or avoiding certain situations. They might have those feelings come up. So when I'm talking to a client and they're just like, Chris, I, I can't, I'm not afraid of dying or hurting someone or spreading contamination. I don't know why it bothers me. Typically, it's that they don't want to feel uncomfortable or feel negative or uh, distressing feelings for an elongated period of time. But typically, like always, when we do our compulsions, it makes us more attuned to it. And they are typically, you know, more attuned to, to distressing feelings. To add to what Liz was saying about like great ERP, the other thing that I like to add in addition, because everything she said was brilliant, is also that it's important that my clients are learning something. You know, if you have, think, go back to school, if we just kind of copied what the teacher said for our math and then turned it in, we might remember in that moment, but after that test is done or that paper is done, zhoosh, we haven't learned anything. What I, you know, going back to the candle uh, exposure that, you know, Liz had you do, Ethan, and, and, you know, touch the candle and stuff like that, it's pulling learning and lessons from that. Like, what did you learn? And there's a couple things you learned. You learned that you can handle the, the candle. You are brave enough to face that that you didn't need all the answers to be willing to do something that over time, most of the things that you've done haven't led to this catastrophic outcome that OCD has threatened you with and that your core fear isn't actually likely to happen. It isn't as scary as you once thought and that you do have the ability to cope and to figure things out and you got to start trusting yourself to be able to handle that. So over time, people learn a lot of great things. I think people more prior ERP, let's say like 1970s, right? It was very robotic, like touch that, don't wash hands, touch that. Now there are so many great lessons that people learn that come out of ERP. And that's one of the reasons that uh, Dr. Grayson always says that people going through ERP and coming out of it are almost better than the average human. And it's why a lot of people can handle distress and not knowing certain things and being unsure because they practice that in treatment. So there's a lot of lessons we learn. There's a lot of learning that happens and there's a lot of concepts that come out of doing ERP that are super useful as well. Thank you, Chris. Anything, Katie? 
No, just, just, I guess, wanted to know with the core fear piece that I, I wanted to just clap with everything that Liz was saying. That was such a huge turning point in my treatment. Um, for me, you know, it, the core fear of everything I had experienced really my whole life, it kind of came down to what if I'm secretly a bad person? What if I'm secretly a horrible person? What is, what does that mean? And one of the really helpful things for me has been, um, even, even throughout recovery, knowing that that is kind of my primary core fear. And when things come up around that, and if I can see that it goes back down to what if I'm a horrible person, what if somebody thinks I'm a horrible person, it's pretty easy for me to put it into the category of if it looks like OCD and smells like OCD, it's probably OCD. And I get to treat it in that way. And that was just really, again, life altering for me in the ERP journey to stop playing whack-a-mole and to start really recognizing anything that falls like in this bubble I get to treat in that same way and I get to wrap uncertainty around it and keep moving forward with my life. So just thank you, Liz, for, for giving everybody that description. Of course. Yeah. And just, again, I think these Ethan's coined the uncertainty blanket statement, right? So Ethan, you can talk about that and how you learn to apply it in your life. Cause I think that's so awesome for people to hear, but you know, it's just important for us to talk about how ERP should go the extra mile. Cause I think I've been hearing a lot and maybe we can talk about this next of like ERP doesn't work for me or ERP isn't the most effective treatment or we need to be thinking about other things. And oftentimes it's because we weren't doing ERP the right way or we weren't having access to really good ERP that's that's going way beyond just the surface triggers. Cause yeah, that's, that's exhausting and that's not the treatment model I want anyone to feel like they have to apply throughout their life. Yeah, well said list. I kind of feel lost because I do have the uncertainty, but like, I don't know that anybody's identified more my core fear. I like, I, I'm now kind of like wondering, like I'm in my head. Like, hmm. Should we do okay. it? Together? Let's do a role play. Let's do a live therapy session in the next couple of days or weeks. Chris, we can do it. Me and you with Ethan. If you're already charging me for that little bit, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, young, guys. That would be so fun. I can probably figure you it should. out myself. Thank you. Um, but I know, uh, I'm over here actually trying, cause I spent enough time with you. I'm like, do I know your core fear? Yeah. I don't know. There's a couple things coming out uh, that are, at the, I feel you know, like you're like shying away from an exposure opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll do whatever I'm One game. Uh, okay. okay. So, um, 7 30 P I love, I absolutely love this question. So, uh, Jess asks, I've struggled with when to trust my feelings. I can see when my anxiety is attached to my OCD and learning to question not to react to that. But how do I know which of my non OCD feelings to trust? Uh, it's a great question in, in OCD and treatment. You know, a lot of clinicians will talk about, you know, feelings can be very misleading, uh, especially around OCD and they're not your friend. We don't gauge uh, whether you're getting better or worse by your feelings, your actions, all that stuff. So we, we tend to say they're valid, but they're not necessarily accurate when it comes to OCD. Um, I'm just going to say one thing off the bat, and then I'll turn it over to the experts, which is um, maybe you're trying to be too perfect around what feelings uh, you should pay attention to and what feelings you shouldn't, and perhaps you should just take a chance and maybe get it wrong. Okay, go. Yeah, I think it's a tough question because, again, we're not, we, we, we don't have enough context to know what feelings we're talking about, right? Because there's a lot of times that actually our gut feelings or, um, you know, can, can be an indicator of something. It doesn't necessarily have to mean we have to respond right away. Right. But sometimes we get feelings about certain things that we're like, ah, oh, that's kind of like interesting. I'm going to put my finger on that, or I'm going to bookmark that and kind of come back to it later, or think about it later. And it can be a healthy way. But I think the way I would model it is that if it, if it feels urgent that you have to respond quickly and right away, like it feels like an anxious response is warranted or needed, maybe treat it more as anxiety or OCD. But if it's something where it's like, and I'll give an example. My husband and I are supposed to go on a trip next weekend and I'm super nervous about leaving the kids. And I just like keep having these feelings of like, should we be going? Should we not be going? Is it too far? What if we can't get back in time? And like, those are normal feelings to think and to kind of weigh out and to, as a parent, be like, what am I comfortable with versus not? How do I set up a system at home that feels safe enough? But also it's not this anxious urgent of like, I can't go anywhere. I definitely can't do a trip at all. It's more just like, okay, like, let me make sure I feel prepared about um, if anything were to happen and we're far away from the kids. And so again, I think that it, it, again, as Katie kept mentioning earlier, it's about the function. Right. We want to know that because if the function is to serve anxiety or that sort of thing across the way, 
we need to keep that in mind. But it's challenging, right? Because, uh, you know, we're taught so much, trust your gut, trust your gut. If you have that instinct, if you have that feeling. And so it's trust like, your gut or feeling about OCD. And we get this a lot, right? I have patients all the time that are like, well, Liz, like, especially the emetophobia, right? The fear of vomiting. It's like, well, I, I really feel a sensation. Therefore, like now it's not OCD. It's like, well, even if you feel a sensation, you can still eat food. Right. So we also don't have to feel perfect to be able to engage in exposures. What I want to add about this, I mean, Liz answered it the best, like urgency. That's a big way to answer that question for you, Jess, is like, is it constant and loud? And one thing I always work with clients is starting to identify the ways that OCD communicates with us, because if you start to learn that it's always urgent, it's always catastrophic. It's never like, oh, I might get a slight cold for a day. It's always you're going to die. Right. It's loud. It's repetitive. Like there's so many ways to start to learn how OCD attacks your feelings so you can start to parse this. But additionally is, you know, there's something called emotional reasoning where unfortunately when we have OCD, we like to listen to all of our feelings and then put that as fact, right? But what makes us different than other animals is there's some animals that they have a certain feeling, they'll react. If they feel like they're being attacked, they'll bite. If they are hungry, they'll eat. They don't really think. But as humans, we can have feelings and not respond. We can be on the freeway and be tired and not immediately go to sleep on the freeway. We could be angry at somebody in line at the store and not kick them. So we have the ability to have the feelings and then not respond. So that's the other thing, Jess, is like if you're at that point where you're not sure about your feelings, don't respond. You don't have to respond in that moment. You can have some separation between the feeling. You can take a more mindful approach that, you know, uh, like that objective observation and just notice the feelings and recognize that they're temporary experiences but you'll start to get good at recognizing like, okay, these feelings are immediate and I always mistakenly give in. And then these feelings aren't as immediate and they're more paired up with normal life stuff. So just remember, you don't have to respond to every emotion or feeling right away. Good point. And, and just to, just to add on to that. Um, I, I love that. I, I think for me, it's been really helpful to pinpoint specifically what, what do I feel like? And even within my body, when OCD kind of starts to, to grab a hold of the wheel, and that can be a really helpful component for me to start to recognize, wait, these feelings probably aren't facts. This is probably just my OCD. Um, and I recognize I get a really distinct kind of urgent feeling in my stomach. But for me also, it tends to be um, very much this sudden shame, this level of guilt and shame oh my goodness, it is urgent that I make sure I'm not this horrific person or that I haven't done something wrong. Um, and again, that urgency kind of for me paired with the shame is so familiar from an OCD perspective that I really can say, okay, feelings probably aren't facts. I can sit with this and maybe come back to it later when it feels less urgent and see, you know, if it's still an issue. But I think one of the things that's been helpful for me, and Ethan said this at the beginning, is even if feelings aren't facts, feelings are still valid. Where I used to be really, really mean to myself, where I would have that guilt and that shame and I, I would... Um, I guess, be like, Katie, why, why are you listening to OCD? Why are you having these feelings? Just make these feelings go away. And I think you can give yourself compassion even in recognizing that these feelings aren't facts and that some of these things coming up might be a product of your OCD. So for me, it's it's been, and I definitely don't do, do this perfectly by any means, but when I am in the mindset to do it, it can be really helpful for me to say, hey, okay, Katie, feelings probably aren't facts, but I'm going to give myself lots of compassion for the guilt and the shame that's coming up right now, probably OCD, and I can sit with it, but I can still give myself lots of love because it can be really hard. Yeah, beautifully said. Also notice how, you know, Liz finally got everything off her chest and just left. And I don't, you know, I don't know how I feel about that. And, but uh, I'm going to just kind of observe that I feel something and move on. So, um, Lots of good questions. Uh, some we've already answered, so I'm going to skip. I'm going to try to get to some that we haven't. Real quick, Kayla at 7.38 p.m. wrote, at Ethan and Katie, careful going all the way to have the best wrong day or I will get a brain bleed is also a sneaky OCD compulsion. It's going after certainty. I had to learn the hard way in. Residential treatment at OCI stopped saying, for example, this will happen because it was avoiding uncertainty. I, I would like to, Kayla, and that's a great point as well. I would just like to simply um, add a follow-up, which is I think, at least in my treatment, it was always with a wink. It was never to, uh, to uh, fully convince. It was always like, yeah, you do. And you're going to have this, you know, like, haha. So I think it always had a hint of wink to it where it wasn't 100% to convince one way or the other. But it's a great point that too can, can be compulsive. Um, I, I love Lightson's comment at 7.41 p.m. 
I finally got therapy appointments and we did do ERP and was, has done wonders for me, despite them suspecting autism was triggering it, the sound sensitivity. ERP takes work, but it is so worth it for me. Just thought I'd share. So we definitely appreciate you sharing. Thank you. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, oh, Robin, we already got to your question. Thanks to Katie about teletherapy. Um, thank you, Katie. Oh, and I, okay. Sorry, not to interrupt, but I did, I did want to mention earlier from folks, just from a lived experience perspective, when I was going through treatment personally, everything I did was teletherapy. I actually only met with my therapist in real life once. And, um, it, it was something way pre COVID where it wasn't quite as common. And, um, it was something that again, for me, very much saved my life. I still very much felt connected to my clinician and to Chris's point, it was actually really helpful for me to be in the environment where I was engaging in a lot of, of the things that were happening with me. Oh, Liz, I, I told everyone that an asteroid may have hit your house, but I guess it's, uh, <laughs> sorry, you guys, I'm on call at the clinic. So when I get a call, I've got to go, but that's what happened. You're fine. I'm back. Um, so I, we're just uh, talking about some really great comments. So Abby at 7.47 p.m. wrote, when I first tried ERP, I refused to do anything. So a therapist finally asked me, well, what can you do? And I started to think, hmm, what small thing can I do? I'm really glad she asked me that. So I love that. And that's the thing. I think we, uh, we're very quick to judge little wins, big wins, what something is substantial. And I think we also do a lot of comparisons. You know, if it's like, if we've been in bed for five for five months or five weeks or however long, and we are able to now take a shower, we probably minimize that. Well, everybody else takes a shower every morning. That's easy for them. That's just part of their day. Like, why should I give myself credit for that? Everybody else is doing it. Well, you know, if, if you've been in bed for five weeks, five months, five years, and you get and haven't showered, and now you're getting up and taking showers, that's a pretty substantial win. Um, so I think it's important to ask yourself, what are the small things? And really, are those small things really small? Because usually those small things aren't, especially in the world of OCD. I think I think little wins are big wins and big wins are ginormous wins. And it's all good stuff. So. One, I- one thing that Abby, real quick, one thing that Abby said that's super important is, you know, the therapist that she was working with did something really powerful. If Abby was going into treatment and felt shut down and closed down, as therapists, we don't just start yelling, keep doing something, keep doing something, right? She took a different approach. And she said that her therapist said, let's be collaborative. One of the things that I think is important is for us to kind of rebrand ERP. What really are we are we doing? Because I think sometimes people look up old stuff from the 80s and it's like, oh, my God, I'm supposed to, you know, lick a, a, a urinal at a, at a public place and it looks terrible. It sounds terrible. No, it's collaborative. It's not fear factor. And so in this moment, Abby was then asked, like, what do you feel comfortable? What can you do? And she was able to start ERP in that manner. I worked with a client who absolutely refused to do treatment. He had been to multiple treatment centers and he was a teen. And I just finally asked him, I'm like, what's the thing you missed most before OCD really hit? And he's like playing video games with friends because, you know, nowadays you can play in your own room, but talk to like 20 people. And I said, what if we don't do treatment, but I just teach you how to play video games again? And he's like, okay spent two weeks because it was an intensive teaching him how to get back into playing video games. And then he's like, Oh, okay. If it works for that, it can work for other things. So what clinicians will do is we're not in a hurry. We're not trying to push you out of your comfort zone. It's collaborative. And so I'm glad Abby, you were able to recognize there was something you could do. And that was sort of the starting point of ERP for you. Thanks for sharing. And I want to just hop in for a second, because I think this is really important actually is I would love to hear from all of us as panelists. Well, I don't need to hear from myself. So I want to hear from y'all. Um, if ERP always worked for you. And I want to talk about this because I think there's this notion that ERP doesn't work for me, for a lot of people. And what I've learned is that maybe, right? But it may also be that we weren't really doing ERP all the way or we weren't committing to it or uh, we weren't ready or you know, it wasn't actually OCD or whatever was going on. And I think this is really important for us because I want to de- demystify, um, I, but really like I want us to understand ERP in a lens of how it could work for us versus it feeling black or white. So Ethan, I want to start with you. Like, Did ERP always work for you? No, no. Liz knows my uh, knows my story and my relationship to ERP and uh, helped me frame things differently. But no, it didn't. I, I definitely, in my own um, healing journey and treatment journey, I spent the first ten or eleven months learning everything I possibly could about ERP. But in my mind, not seeing progress and continually continuing to struggle significantly. 
and definitely believing that ERP didn't work for me. I was too severe. My OCD was too far gone. Um, I had suffered too long. Um, you know, there were a number of things that had to happen, but I can tell you without a doubt uh, in retrospect that it was definitely, and not to my fault, it wasn't a fault of mine, but at that time I was very much not in a place to fully embrace ERP, to fully surrender to the things that I needed to surrender to. I was too scared. I was too terrified. I was very, what's called fixed beliefs. I had a very fixed belief system based on so many decades of reinforcing and reassuring. And so it was very difficult for me to engage in ERP, even though I felt like I was giving it all. Um, deep down, I also knew I was, I really wasn't willing to let go of how I, how I was, how I had been maladaptively coping with my fear of, of harm, of self-harm, of being sick. Everything felt irresponsible. And in the back of my mind, everything everybody was asking me to do felt insane. Like even if I was doing it halfway, it still felt crazy. Like you, you got to be out of your mind. Um, I think through a series of, and if you know my story, you don't know my story. Like I went through a series of things. And after that, um, other, other, other types of treatment that really opened up room for the ERP to seep in there. And once that happened, I saw exponential growth in my recovery because uh, ERP just started working because I had already learned everything about it and I was able to engage it extremely fully. And um, I mean, it is without a question, along with acceptance commitment therapy, uh, for me, the thing that, that keeps me um, you know, in, in remission for the most part and, and away from relapsing. And, but uh, for many, for a few years after I got better, I, I, would st I stood by the fact, no, 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 ERP didn't work for me you know, acceptance commitment therapy is what changed my life. When really in, re in retrospect, acceptance commitment therapy is what I needed to then properly engage ERP. And it kind of opened my mind to look at it in a different way to where it became really effective in my own treatment. Yeah. So I love this. And I think what's so important, Ethan, is recognizing that at any given point, you might've been someone who says, oh, ERP doesn't work for me, but you were an advocate and kept trying, right? And you were able to find a modality that allowed you to be ready for ERP and then ERP worked beautifully. And I say this because I think a lot of times we have this black and white feeling of like, or thinking of ERP works or it doesn't compared to like, okay, maybe I'm just not ready for it yet. Or maybe I'm trying ERP with one foot in one foot out and I'm actually never going to see the progress. So Katie, what about you? Oh, this, this is such a great question. I was, I was actually getting emotional listening to Ethan, but then also thinking about this for me, um, because actually pretty recently, um, I would say probably at the 2019 conference where, um, you know, it's, it doesn't seem all that long ago, but I was in a completely different space in life. And in my OCD journey, um, I was at the conference, didn't want to talk to anybody, um, saw advocates and very much thought this will never work for me. I'll never get better. It was after relapsing for me. And if someone would have come up and asked me, I very much would have said ERP isn't working for me. Um, it was, and I, I wasn't aware of that, but really for me, I was working really hard at the exposures and I wasn't engaging in the response prevention in ways that I thought that I was. Um, I, I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but for me, I was so looped into, I was um, a school chaplain navigating tragedies and traumas with students and had lost individuals in my life. And my harm OCD had very much latched onto that. And I started very tangibly to think that I was responsible for the losses of people in the community. And I had done so many compulsions, um, checking to make sure that I hadn't gone certain places or that I had been busy at certain times to actually try to convince myself that I hadn't somehow committed crimes and forgotten about it. And by the time I got back into treatment, I was so looped into this that it felt totally irresponsible to let it go. So what was happening for me is I was engaging in these really intense exposures, but then I would sit there and almost call the police on myself for crimes I didn't commit. Then I would call my mom after and say, well, do you really think I could have murdered somebody and forgot about it? I would go and I would ask my students, hey, did you see me after school? Um, was, it, was I really in this place? So it was this really interesting dynamic of I was doing the exposures and I felt like, why am I not getting better? But I wasn't willing to let go of all of the compulsions that I was doing to try to keep myself safe and to try to keep my community safe. And that it was incredibly, obviously emotional for me. There was so much kind of trauma tied into that too. But the big turning point for me was 
finally embracing that uncertainty and saying, you know what, I, I'm willing to risk all of that scary stuff being true for a chance to really um, start not doing these compulsions. And my therapist was very hard on me about that. We realized that that was the reason I wasn't getting better. It wasn't because ERP wasn't working. I really just wasn't doing response prevention. And we actually, um, this sounds really harsh, but it, we actually wrote a note card for myself. And I um, Every time I wanted to ruminate or I wanted to engage in a compulsion around this particular theme, I looked at my note card that said, um, I am making the choice to engage in this compulsion and it is willing, I am willingly making myself sicker. And um, I, I had also had a voicemail from my mom on my phone at the time that said the same thing. And I would listen to that from her. And um, I made the choice to stop doing those compulsions that I had done for so long. And it was why I got better. So again, I, I'm, it's, and I'm, again, very emotional for me. But for me, it wasn't that ERP wasn't working. I wasn't willing to do the RP part of it. Katie, I got chills when you were sharing the note card statement, because I think that it's it's so hard for us to really say out loud that this is a choice I'm making and that this choice is keeping me ill, but it's also really important piece of treatment and of recovery because it also allows us to have the power to recognize we can make a different choice mm -hmm. um, and that we don't have to feed OCD. And so to push core fears, I'm guessing that you've really worked on leaning into like, eh, like, I don't know for sure if I'm this amazing person, but I'm going to live my life anyways and hope that I am. And that that's that uncertainty piece that you lean into every day. Yeah. And it doesn't mean for folks listening, it doesn't mean that it's easy every day. Ethan hears me, you know, some days are, are harder with that than others, but I continue to work on that core fear and it is absolutely worth it leaning into the uncertainty around that thing. That's really scary for me because that's how I get to go out and live my life and do all the things that are meaningful and valuable to me each and every day. That's right. Chris, I still want to, I need to hear from you. I know we're over time and I took over Ethan, but I'll be quiet after, but I just, I want to hear your story. Yeah. Because I, you know, because you have such a story of like, once you got it, you, you, I feel like you were so committed to it and the difference, like there was just such this outcome so quick and it really worked and you were so hungry for it. But um, would there have ever been a time where you would have thought ERP didn't work or for you, was it a different experience? Yeah, no, when I first entered ERP, I mean, I, at the time I had just come off playing uh, three competitive sports. I played football, soccer and volleyball. I also played tennis, too, in college. And so to me, I was always somebody that like stepped up to the occasion. I always thought like, I'm going to jump in, I'm going to play hard and you put your effort on, you know, put your all in the field. So when I met with my clinician, finally finding someone that specialized in OCD and she talked about exposure response prevention, one thing I really appreciate is she didn't talk about it as like the scary, horrific thing that you're going to have to figure out. It was more so like, we're going to get your life back. And I loved the way it was presented. When I started doing ARP, once again, it made so much sense. It's like, if I'm choosing, kind of like Katie was saying, if I'm choosing to do all these things and just reinforce this disorder, what if I start choosing not to do those things? Then I'll stop reinforcing the disorder. Like my attention to it is really giving it power. So for the first six months of treatment, I was an extreme. I don't I, The only thing I would scare people about my story is I'm like, six months feels like a long time. But I always remember I was a very extreme case. But the first six months went super well. The only time I questioned ERP is when I started getting to those much more difficult things. And I'm talking about things I hadn't done in years. I hadn't had somebody in my car in like six or seven years because I feared getting in a crash and them dying and being guilty about it. I hadn't had people in my room in my personal space. So when I hit a wall and kind of a plateau, what really helped in that moment was medication. Uh, my, my therapist is like, look, you're doing everything right, but you're not, these harder things are giving you such extreme anxiety. It's not that the treatment doesn't work. It's just that the anxiety from it is so intense. So going on medication, I was able to jump back on the ship and do really well in ERP, finish after about 14 months of treatment. And then ERP became a lifestyle for me. So as I volunteered at an animal shelter, because it was triggering for me to be around animals and pet born diseases, I got a job at a gym, which was really nerve wracking. because I was afraid I was going to re-rack weights and and they'd fall on somebody and injure someone. It became a lifestyle. I'd say the only other time in my life that I ever questioned ERP is I really struggled with certain smells. Like certain things just made me feel really disgusted. It was things like coffee, bacon, pizza, cigarette smoke, campfire smoke, etc. And those things would bother me and I'd do ERP all the time and it never got better. 
And it went until I read an article by Rich Gallagher, who's somebody that's a great OCD therapist. And he talked about what helped for him is instead of focusing so much on the trigger, focus doing what you enjoy doing and just know that that trigger is going to be there and learn to live with that trigger versus trying to either expose yourself to it or push it away. And so I'm not a big coffee fan, but I like tea. So I was like, you know what? I'd like to go to a Starbucks and start getting tea and enjoying a coffee shop. And I started doing that and focusing more on engaging in the activity. And I just sort of got used to the smell of coffee and the smell of, uh, you know, if I go up to LA, the smell of smoke. So it became something where it worked. It was just the the frame in it. But no, I mean, I, I always trusted the treatment. I'm a real big believer in research and knowing that how research and how many people it helped, I really felt that because I leaned into it. It, it really got me to a point that I'm in now where recovery is like a lifestyle for sure. Yeah. Four different press all merged in the same place. You know, that's pretty powerful. You know, it's awesome. It's, I think that's the power of ERP that you're hearing. And what I want you to hear is that if ERP hasn't worked for you, I want you to think about why did you fully lean in? Were you ready? And um, did you need to maybe do, or do you need to consider some other things first versus just jumping to that being the end answer that it doesn't work? Um, and I'm not going to get relief from OCD because I think there's living proof everywhere that ERP can be an incredible treatment that can help give you your life back. Um, and so can other modalities as well. It's also neat. Um, I mean, we are over, so we'll, we'll close it down, but it's, it's also neat. Um, because, you know, to Liz's point, if you tried ERP and it didn't work, and then you may need to try another modality of treatment. I know in my case, what was really cool is when I try that other modality, we stopped doing ERP. I stopped treatment completely because they were basically like, we don't have anything else to teach you. So you're going to live your life and we're going to teach you this other modality. And it was wild because at a certain point, it was like, it suddenly clicked for me. I got it. I got why I needed to surrender and like this barrier that had been there but just lifted and everything that I had learned just poured out. And it wasn't like I, I didn't start from the beginning. I didn't go back to ERP therapy. I didn't do any ERP therapy. 10 months of straight ERP therapy just poured out of my brain and I just started doing it like I was programmed to do it already. Like the programming was in there and then the act activated it and then it kicked in. And I think that's what's really exciting is that to Liz's point, you know, Maybe it didn't work, but it's in there, right? And if you can find that other key that unlocks it, then it will come pouring out. And that's what happened for me. So I think that's really exciting. Uh, with that, let's wrap up. Uh, first, thank you to Chris, Liz, and and Katie for, for joining us on ARP 101. We'll do a 201 coming up because this was a really great conversation. Also, thank you to all, you all for your great, great questions and your comments and and your advocacy within the thread and suggestions. I know we can't get to every question, but you always get to every question. So we appreciate your, your um, participation in the comments and, and, and giving your, your, your time to uh, support and lift up other folks. Um, with that, I want to thank the IOCDF and Amanda behind the scenes. Uh, real quick, OCD Camp is this weekend. Register now for this awesome event created for youth with OCD and their families. The program will include live sessions for parents, guardians, and opportunities for fun socialization with families. To register, you can visit iocdf.org forward slash camp. You will see Chris. You will see Katie. Um, and Liz runs in a, a camp. I don't know. That was a terrible joke. It didn't make sense. Moving on. Um, <laughs> I don't know where I was going. with. Yeah, it was bad. Registration uh, for online hoarding disorder conference is also open. Uh, this conference offers an opportunity to professionals from therapists and social workers to firefighters and other public safety officials to learn how to effectively and compassionately uh, work with how to work effectively and compassionately with individuals with hoarding disorder. It will be held March 4th through 5th. You can register today online. Uh, finally, you can uh, the live stream is one of many. You can see the entire schedule of future live streams at iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind. Of course, if you have questions, comments, concerns, need resources, you can always visit iocdf.org and you can always email the IOCDF at info at iocdf.org. With all of that, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Really appreciate you spending your time. Um, is there a stream tomorrow? Yeah, we'll be there. 9 a.m. our time in the West I Coast. Your time. Oh, I'm like, yeah. who's time? In the West Coast. We are, Liz and I are doing an Ask the Expert, so we love for you to have more of your questions to come on. 
uh, asking anything OCD related and related disorders. And Liz and I will answer them for both a clinical lens and obviously lived experience. So it's not, it's the same place you're watching now, 9 a.m. if you're on the West Coast, 11 a.m. if you're in the middle of the country like Liz, and then noon on the East Coast. Look at you, uh, Chris. For the East Coast people. Dude, do you know how long it took me to figure all those time zones out? Yeah, I just figured out you. right now. I'm proud of you. So hard. So hard. It's 5 p.m. in the UK. And it's at 6 a.m. in Hawaii because there's somebody that emailed me that they've been watching from Hawaii and they're like, but it's so early at 6 a.m. So that's the only reason I know. And with all of that, you're welcome for that lessons in time zones. Uh, maybe we'll do a panel on it coming up. Just anyway, that. thanks for spending your Tuesday evening with us. Stay safe, stay vigilant, feel the feels, don't let OCD off the hook, and we'll see you next time. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>